is a human rights activist and my fellow Canadian and author of Unveiled, which is a very honest and compelling book. Yasmin, you uh, were basically raised on the fault line between East and West, as it were. Um, and, that, and that's a difficult thing to negotiate, even within your own family. What's the psychology at work here where thousands of young men of Pakistani origin think uh, English girls are complete garbage and they can do what they will with them? Uh, well, there's definitely um, an us and them mentality that mm. we're taught, mm. or that I was taught when I was being raised Muslim. Mm. Um, you can see it if you look at the, the Prophet of Islam, when he would you know, when they would go to war and what he would do afterwards is take the women and children as sex slaves, pass them around to his companions. You saw that being repeated in Iraq and Syria with ISIS doing that with the Yazidi women. Um, they view non-Muslim women as inhuman, lesser than, you know, it's a, it's a disdain um, also in Islam, you know, there's a, it, it's, it's horrible to say this, you know, mm. I feel, I feel sick saying this, mm. um, but it's a, it, it, the, the us and them mentality is very insidious. It's very dark. Um, and you know, we like to pretend that it's not there. We like to pretend mm. that we're all kumbaya and we can yeah. all have, you know, intercultural, interreligious relations and everything. We can all coexist. Mm. But the truth is that, um, you know, the religion does teach that Muslims are, you know, this world is for them. This land is for them. And non-Muslims are just to be, you know, conquered, destroyed, they have to, you know, submit to Allah. Okay. And so that just carries through with the relationship between men but, and women. But, but let me, I mentioned earlier, just with Vicky's dog from the streets of Cairo, that, that your family, uh, you have an Egyptian background. Um, and if you go back, it's not that far back, if you go back 75 years, uh, King Farouk basically uh, reigned over a society that at that point mimicked the West in many ways. In fact, if I remember correctly, uh, King Farouk's sister, who died a couple of years ago, was a spectacularly beautiful woman. She looked like a Hollywood star of the 19th. She looked like Hedy Lamarr or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and at that, so at that point, uh, the the uh, Muslim regimes in Muslim countries were more compatible with the Western world than is, is it something to do with us with our lack of cultural confidence? Uh, well, what it is, it's an there's an anti-Westernism, mm. and the anti-Westernism is translated as a pro-Islamism, mm. and so they. They bring, they go back to the fundamentals of Islam, the, you know, mm -hmm. the extremists do. They're bringing back, as I guess, s similar to like the Old Testament right. kind of ways um, and saying we should live the way the prophet lived. And those are the people that are very anti-West. And it's very trendy and hip and cool to be anti-West these days. And mm -hmm. so there, those two things exist in, in parallel anti-West and pro-Islamism, which is very, very dangerous. We've seen mm. it in Iran. We've seen it in Syria. We've seen it in Lebanon. We've seen it all around. Um, and we're seeing it here in the West now, too. Um, I, people are telling me every day how much, how more common it is for them to see hijab on the streets. Right. Um, they grew up in the UK or they grew up in America or they grew up in Canada and they didn't wear hijab. Nobody didn't, yeah. that they knew did. And now everybody's starting to wear it kind of as a, like a, a political anti-Western sentiment. Yeah, that's true. If you were in the East End right now, you'd be seeing more hijabs than you would have seen in Amman, say, 30 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Are you astonished, though, at the, that, that diversity and multiculturalism have such a grip on us that even when these stories come out day after day about 
girls being gang raped, being taken as sex slaves, not in Waziristan, mm -hmm. but in Rotherham and Oldham and Rochdale. Are you astonished at the heartlessness of a society that doesn't care about that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, women, girls and women are treated like this all over the world, right? Young girls are getting exploited all over the world, especially vulnerable young girls. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Canada, we even have this issue with, with trafficking of mm -hmm. girls. So that happens everywhere. But what makes this situation unique is, of course, the, the, the racial part of it. And because of the perpetrators are mostly Pakistani, mm -hmm. what that causes is that nobody wants to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to address it. And that's why it got worse and worse and worse and worse. And that's why the poor victims mm -hmm. are not getting the justice that they deserve, because there's this fear of Islamophobia. Yeah. And that's what's making this situation so much worse than all of the other situations of, of exploitation that we see around the world. You, you can say that because of your background and because of your name, although you do pay a, a, a price for it because there are many Muslims who hate you and would gladly see you dead. Do you think it's time that, uh, you know, English and Scots and Canadian and whatever just stop tippy-toeing around on that and we're honest well, we about this? To. We have to. We absolutely have to. We have to be able to speak we have to be able to criticize things that need to be criticized. So mm. this was a major part of my book. So the, the, how Western liberals empower radical yeah. Islam. They are essentially empowering the radicals when they don't want to talk about it, when they mm. want to ignore it, when they want to sweep it under the rug. Mm. If they want to eradicate these kinds of things, what they need to do is support the reform mm. Muslims, support the progressive Muslims, support those Muslims that are speaking out against these things. But instead, there's a fear of speaking out against extremists yeah. and so that empowers them even more.